Before Annette should ever set foot on the ha on the high wire, or even a practice rope, her father had taught her a fall. To protect her head and minimize the impact by not fighting her own momentum. Even as the blast from the harbor lifted her off her feet, she was tucked into a roll. She hit hard, but she was up in seconds, pressed against the side of a crate, her ears ringing, her nose singed by the sharp scent of gunpowder. Inez spared Kaz and the others a single glance. Then, do as she did best. She vanished. She launched herself up onto the cargo crates, scaling them like a nimble insect, her rubber-soled feet guiding, finding grips and footholds. The view from above was disturbing. The dregs were unnumbered, and there were men working their way around the, their left and right flanks. Kaz had been right to keep their real points of departure a secret from the others. Someone had talked. Inesha tried to keep tabs on the team, but someone else in the gang could have been snooping. Kaz had said it himself. Everything in Ketterdam leaked, including the slat and the crow club. Someone was firing down from the mast of the new Fairland. Hopefully, that meant Jesper had made it to the schooner, and she just had to buy the others enough time to make it there as well. Inez ran lightly over the ropes of the crates, tops of the crates, making her way down the row, seeking her targets below. It was easy enough. None of them expected a threat to come from above. She slid to the ground behind two men firing at Nina, and said a silent prayer as she slit one throat, then the next. When the second man dropped, she crouched beside him and rolled up his right sleeve, a tattoo of a hand, his first and the second fingers cut off at the knuckle, black tips. Was this retribution for Kaz's showdown with Giles, or something more? They shouldn't have been able to raise these kinds of numbers. She moved on to the next aisle of crates, following a mental map of the other's attack's position, attacker's positions. First, she took down a girl holding a massive unwieldy rifle, then skewered the man who was supposed to be watching her flank. His tattoo showed five birds in a wedge formation, razor gulls. Just how many gangs were they up against? The next corner was blind. Should she scale the cargo container to check her position, or risk what might be waiting at for her on the other side. She took a deep breath, sank low, and slipped around the corner in a lunge. Tonight her saints were kind. Two men were firing on the docks with their backs to her. She dispatched them with two quick thrusts of her blades. Six bodies, six lives taken. She was going to have to do a lot of penance, but she'd helped, the other, she'd helped even the odds a bit in the drag's favor. Now she needed to get to the schooner. She wiped her knives on her leather bri breeches and returned them to their sheaths, then backed up and took a running start to the nearest cargo container. As her fingers gripped the rim, she felt the piercing pain beneath her arm. She turned in time to see Uman's ugly face split in a determined grimace. All the intelligence she had gathered on the black tips came back, into her in came back to her in a sickening rush. Uman Giles, shambling enforcer, the one who could crush skulls with his bare hands. He yanked her down and grabbed her, grabbed the front of her vest, giving the knife in her side a sharp twist. Inej fought not to black out. As her hood fell back, he exclaimed, Gizan, I've got Brucker's wreath. You should have aimed higher, Inej gasped. Missed my heart. Don't want you dead, Wraith, he said. You're quite the prize. Can't wait to hear all hear all the gossip you've gathered for dirty hands and all his secrets too i love a good story i can tell you how this one ends she said on an unsteady breath but you're not gonna like it that's so he slammed her up against the crate and the pain crashed through her her toes only brushed the ground as blood spurted from the wound at her side woman's forearm was braced against her shoulders keeping her arms pinned do you know the secret to fighting a scorpion he laughed talking nonsense wraith don't die too quick need to get you patched up she crossed one ankle beneath the other and heard a reassuring click she wore the pads at her knees for crawling and climbing but there was another reason too namely the tiny steel blades hidden in each of them the secret she panted is to never take your eyes off the scorpion's tail she brought her knee up jamming the blade between Newman's legs he shrieked and released her hands going to his bleeding groin. She staggered back down the row of crates. 
She could hear men shouting to each other. The pop of gunfire coming in smatters and bursts now. Who is winning? Had the others made it to the schooner? A wave of dizziness rolled over her. When she touched her fingers to the wound at her side, they came away wet. Too much blood. Footsteps. Someone was coming. She couldn't climb. Not with this wound. Not with the amount of blood she'd lost. She remembered her father putting her on the rope ladder the first time. For the first time. Climb an edge. The cargo containers were stacked like a pyramid here. If she could make it up just one, she could hide herself on the first level. Just one. She could climb. Or she could stand there and die. She willed her mind to clarify and hopped up, fingertips latching onto the top of the crate. Climb an edge. She dragged herself over the edge onto the tin roof of the container. It felt so good to lie there, but she knew she left a trail of blood behind her. One more, she told herself. One more and you'll be safe. She forced herself up onto her knees and reached for the next crate. The surface beneath her began to rock. She heard laughter from below. Come out, come out, Wraith. We have secrets to tell. Desperately, she reached for the lip of the next crate again and gripped it, fighting through an onslaught of pain as the container under her dropped away. Then she was just hanging, legs dangling helplessly down. They didn't open fire. They wanted her alive. Come on down, Wraith. She didn't know where the strength came from, but she managed to pull herself over the top. She lay on the crate's roof, panting. Just one more, but she couldn't. Couldn't push to her knees. Couldn't reach. Couldn't even roll. It hurt too much. Climb an edge. I can't, she whispered. Even now, she hated to disappoint. Move, she told herself. This is a stupid place to die. And yet a voice in her head said there were worse places. She would die here, in freedom, beneath the beginnings of dawn. She'd die over a worthy fight, not because some man had tried, tied, had tired of her or required more from her than she could give. Better to die here by her own blade than with her face painted and her body swathed in false silks. A hand seized her ankle. They climbed the crates. Why hadn't she heard them? Was she gone? That was she that far gone? They had her. Someone was turning her onto her back. She slid the dagger from the sheath at her wrist. In the barrel, a blade this sharp was known as kind steel. It meant quick death. Better that than torture at the mercy of the black tips or the razor gulls. May the saints receive me. She pressed the tip beneath her breast, between her ribs, an arrow to her heart. The hand gripped her wrist painfully, forcing her to drop the blade. Not just yet an edge. The rasp of stone on stone. Her eyes flew open. Kaz. He bundled her into his arms and leapt down from the crates, landing roughly, his bad leg buckled, buckling. She moaned as they hit the ground. Did we win? I'm here, aren't I? He must be running. Her body jounced painfully against his chest with every lurching step. He needed his cane. I don't want to die. I'll do my best to make other arrangements for you. She closed her eyes. Keep talking, Wraith. Don't slip away from me. But it's what I do best. He clutched her tighter. Just make it to the schooner. Open your damn eyes, Inej. She tried. Her vision was blurring, but she can make out a pale, shiny scar on Kaz's neck, right beneath his jaw. She remembered the first time she'd seen him at the menagerie. He paid Tonta Helene for information, stock tips, political pillow talk, Anything the menagerie's clients babbled on about when drunk or giddy on bliss. He never visited Helene's girls, though plenty would have been happy to take him up to their rooms. They claimed he gave her th they claimed he gave them the shivers, that his hands were permanently stained with blood beneath those black gloves. But she recognized the eagerness in their voices, and the way they tracked him with their eyes. One night he passed her on and he passed her in the parlor. She'd done a foolish thing, a reckless thing. I can help you, she whispered. He glanced at her, then proceeded on his way as if she said nothing at all. The next morning, she'd been called to Tanta Helene's parlor. She'd been sure another beating was coming, or worse. But instead, Kaz Brecker had been standing there, 
leaning on his crow head cane, waiting to change your life. I can help you, she said now. Tell me with what? She couldn't remember. There was something she was supposed to tell him. It didn't matter anymore. Talk to me, Wraith. You came back for me. I protect my investments. Investments. I'm glad I'm bleeding all over your shirt. I'll put it on your tab. Now she remembered. He owed her an apology. Say you're sorry. For what? Just say it. She didn't hear his reply. The world had grown very dark indeed. Get us out of here, Kaz shouted, as soon as he limped aboard the schooner with a nudge in his arms. The sails were already trimmed, and they were on their way out of the harbor in moments, though not nearly as fast as he would have liked. He knew he should have tried to secure some squalors for the journey, but they were held to come by. There was chaos on deck, people shouting and trying to get the schooner into open sea as quickly as possible. Specked, he yelled, at the man he'd chosen to captain the vessel. A sailor with a talent for knife work who had fallen on, his, on hard times and ended up stuck in the lower ranks of the dregs. Get your crew in shape before I start cracking skulls. Spex saluted, then seemed to catch himself. He wasn't in the navy any longer, and Kaz wasn't a commanding officer. The pain in Kaz's leg was terrible. The worst that had been since the, he'd first broken it, falling off the roof of a bank near the Geldstrat. It was possible he'd fractured the bone again. And Edge's weight wasn't helping, but when Jesper stepped into his path to offer help, Kaz shoved past him. Where's Nina? Kaz snarled. Seeing to the wounded below, she already took care of me. Dimly, Kaz registered the dry blood on Jesper's thigh. Wylan got dinged during the fight. Let me help you. Get out of my way, Kaz said, and plunged past him down the ramp that led, the, that led below decks. He found Nina tending to Wylan in a narrow cabin, her hands drifting over his arms, knitting the flesh of the bullet wound together. It was barely a graze. Move, Kaz demanded, and Wylan practically leapt from the table. I'm not finished, began Nina. Then she caught sight of Inej. Saints, she swore. What happened? A knife wound. The cramped cabin was lit by several bright lanterns and a stash of clean bandages that had been laid out on a shelf beside a bottle of camphor. Gently, Kaz placed an edge on the table that had been bolted to the deck. That's a lot of blood, Nina said on, said on a low breath. Help her. Kaz, I'm a heart render, not a real healer. She'll be dead by the time we find one. Get to work. You're in my light. Kaz stepped back into the passageway. Nez lay perfectly still on the table, her luminous brown skin dull in the swaying lamplight. He was alive because of Inej. They all were. They managed to fight their way out of a corner, but only because she prevented them from being surrounded. Kaz knew death. He could feel its presence on the ship now, looming over them, ready to take his wraith. He was covered in her blood. Unless you can be useful, go away. Nina said without looking up at him. You're making me nervous. He hesitated, then stomped back the way he'd come, stopping to purloin a clean shirt from another cabin. He shouldn't be this shaken up by a dock brawl, even a shootout, but he was. Something inside him felt frayed and raw. It was the same feeling he had as a boy in those first de desperate days against desperate days after Geordie's death. Say you're sorry. That was the last thing Inej had said to him. What had she wanted him to apologize for? There were so many possibilities. A thousand crimes. A thousand stupid jibes. On deck, he took a deep breath of sea air, watching the harbor in Ketterdam fade from view on the horizon. What the hell just happened? Jesper asked. He was leaning against the railing, his rifle beside him, hair disheveled, pupils dilated. He seemed almost drunk, or like he'd rolled around on something on someone's bed. Or just rolled out of someone's bed. He always had that look after a fight. Helva was bent over the railing, vomiting. Not a sailor, apparently. At some point, they needed to shackle his legs again. We were ambushed, Wylan said from his perch on the forecastle deck. 
He had his sleeve pushed up and was running his fingers over the red spot where Nina had seen to his wound. Jesper shot while in a withering gaze. Glare. Private tutor from the university, and that's what this kid comes up with. We were ambushed. Wylan Redden, stop calling me kid. We're practically the same age. You're not going to like the other names I come up with for you. I know we were ambushed. That doesn't explain how we would be there. How they knew we would be there. Maybe Big Bolliger wasn't the only black tip spy on in the dregs. Gills doesn't have the brains or the resources to bite back this fast or this hard alone. Kaz said. You sure? Because it felt like a pretty big bite. Let's ask. Kaz limped over to where Roddy had helped him stash Uman. I stuck your wraith. Uman had giggled when Kaz had spotted him curled up on the ground. I stuck her good. Kaz had glanced at the blood on Uman's thigh and said, Looks like she got two, too. But her aim had, had been off, or Uman wouldn't have been talking to anyone. But her aim had been off, or Uman wouldn't have been talking to anyone. He knocked the enforcer out and had Roddy retrieve him while he went to find an edge. Now Halvar and Jasper dragged Uman over the rail, his hands bound. Stand him up. With one huge hand, Halvar hauled Uman to his feet. Uman grinned, his thatch of coarse white hair flat against his wide forehead. Why don't you tell me what brought so many black tips out in force tonight, Kaz said. We owed you. A public brawl with guns out and 30 men packing? I don't think so. Uman snickered. Giles doesn't like being bested. I could fit Giles' brain in the toe of my boot, and Big Bolliger was his only source inside the dregs. Maybe he... Kaz interrupted him. I want you to think real careful now, Uman. Giles probably thinks you're dead, so there's no rules for barter here. I can do what I want with you. Uman spat in his face. Kaz took a handkerchief from his coat pocket and carefully wiped his face clean. He thought of Inej lying still on the table, her slight weight in his arms. Hold him, he told Jesper in the Fjordan. Kaz flicked his coat sleeve, and an oyster shucking knife appeared in his hand. At any given time, he had at least two knives stashed somewhere in his clothes. He didn't even count this one, really. A tidy, wicked little blade. He made a neat slash across Uman's eye, from below to the cheekbone, from brow to cheekbone, and before Uman could draw breath to cry out, he made a second cut in the opposite direction, a nearly perfect X. Now Uman was screaming. Kaz wiped the knife clean, returned it to his sleeve, and drove his gloved fingers into Uman's eye socket. He shrieked and twitched as Kaz yanked out his eyeball, its base trailing a bloody, rot, bloody root. Blood gushed over his face. Kaz heard while in retching. He tossed the eyeball overboard and jammed a spit-soaked handkerchief into the socket where Uman's eye had been. Then he grabbed Uman's jaw, his glove leaving red smears on the enforcer's chin. His actions were smooth, precise, as if he were dealing cards at the Crow Club or picking an easy lock. But his rage felt hot and mad and unfamiliar. Something within him had, a, within him had torn loose, Listen to me, he hissed, his face inches from movements. You have two choices. You tell me what I want to know, and we drop you at our next port, with your pockets full of enough coin to get you sewn up and buy you passage back to Kerch. Or, I take the other eye, and I repeat this conversation with the blind man. It was just a job, babbled Uman. Gil's got 5,000 Kruger to bring the black tips out in force. You pulled in some razor gulls too. Then why not more men? Why not double your odds? You were supposed to be on the boat when it blew. We were just supposed to take care of the stragglers. Who hired you? Uman wavered, sucking on his lip. It's not running from his nose. Don't make me ask again, Uman, Kaz said quietly. Whoever it was can't protect you now. He'll kill me, and I'll make you wish for death, so you have to weigh those options. Pekka Rollins, Uman sobbed. His Pekka Rollins. Even through his own shock, Kaz registered the effect of the name of, on Jesper and Wylan. Halvar didn't know enough to be intimidated. Saints, groaned Jesper. We are so screwed. Is Rollins leading the crew himself? Kaz asked Uman. What crew? Defirda. I don't know about no crew. 
We were just supposed to stop you from getting on, getting out of the harbor. I see. I need a medic. Can you take me to a medic now? Of course, Kaz said. Right this way. He took him in by the lapels and hoisted him off his feet, bracing his body against the railing. I told you what you wanted, Uman screamed, struggling. I did what you asked. Despite Uman's knobby build, he was deceptively strong, farm strong, like Jasper. He'd probably grown up in the fields. Kaz leaned in so that no one else could hear it when he said, My wraith would counsel mercy, but thanks to you, she's here to plead she's not here to plead your case. Without another word, he tipped Uman into the sea. No, Wyland shouted, leaning over the railing, his face pale, stunned eyes tracking Uman in the waves. The enforcer's pleas were still audible as his maimed face faded from view. You, you said if he helped you. Do you want to go over too? asked Kaz. Wyland took a deep breath as if sucking incursion sputtered. You won't throw me overboard. You need me. Why do people keep saying that? Maybe, said Kaz, but I'm not in a very rational mood. Jasper set his hand on Wyland's shoulder. Let it go. It's not right. Wyland, Jasper said, giving him a little shake. Maybe your tutors didn't cover this lesson, but you do not argue with a man covered in blood and a knife up his sleeve. Wyland pressed his, thin his lips into a thin line. Kaz couldn't tell if the kid was frightened or furious and he didn't much care. Halber stood silent, sentinel, observing it all, looking seasick green beneath his blonde beard. Kaz turned to Jasper, fit Halber with some shackles to keep him honest. He said as he headed below, and get me clean clothes and fresh water. Since when am I your valet? Man with a knife, remember? He said over his shoulder. Man with a gun, Jasper called after him. Jasper replied, Kaz replied with a time-saving gesture that relied heavily on his middle finger and disappeared below decks. He wanted a hot bath and a bottle of brandy, but he'd settle for being alone and free on, of the stink of blood for a while. Pekka Rollins. The name rattled through his head like gunfire. It always came back, came back to Pekka Rollins, the man who had taken everything from him, the man who now stood between Kaz and the biggest haul any crew had ever attempted. Would Roland send someone in his place, or lead the crew to nab Bo Bo Buyer himself? In the dim confines of his cabin, Kaz whispered the words, brick by brick. Killing Pekka Rollins had always been tempting, but that wasn't enough. Kaz wanted Rollins brought low. He wanted him to suffer the way Kaz had, the way Geordi had. And snatching 30 million Kruger right out of Pekka Rollins' grubby hands was a very good way to start. Maybe Inej was right. Maybe fate did bother with people like him.